everybody. Hello. 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 Yeah, Hello. it's a call and response. <laughs> Play in a black space. Hello. 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 All right, thank you. Jeez. OK. Um, my name is Sasanke Simang. Welcome, everyone, to the launch. Yay. to begin by acknowledging that we are on Dunga Puja to pay my respects to elders past and present um, and to talk about what an honor I think it is that we are able to have this particular conversation about these histories and about slavery and its afterlife and about uh, agricultural production and, um, and the struggles around racial justice in this place. Uh, on the unceded lands of Noma people in the Wajak Nation. I think it is especially powerful that we have this conversation in this place and acknowledge that we are guided in this conversation by ancestors. So welcome everybody. As I've said, my name is Sisong Kim Simang. I'm gonna introduce Anna, although she needs no introduction, but I'm gonna do the formal thing because people are watching us on live stream. Um, oh yeah, we should probably just let you all know. Yeah. This is being live streamed on Instagram live. Very. Oh, I need to speak a lot more loud. Yes, we need to speak louder. Can everybody hear us? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yes, so this is being live streamed on Instagram live. It'll be mostly just, just, just us, us. Yeah. but if you have any issues, just let us know. Yeah. And we'll then turn the camera away. Or we'll just tell you not to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna Kesson Aaron Vincent is, Aaron Vincent Kesson is an immigrant art historian, writer, and curator. She was born in Sri Lanka, later moved to Australia and New Zealand, where she trained and worked as a registered nurse, so she can help if any emergencies happen. Not any A career that also took her to the UK and Ghana. After studying for a BA at the University of Western Australia, she transitioned to a career in the humanities, which is why we're here, completing a PhD in African American Studies and Art History at Yale University. At Princeton, she holds the position of Assistant Professor of Black Diasporic Art with a joint appointment in the Department of African American Studies and Art and Archaeology. In her research and teaching, she focuses on Black Diaspora and British art with an emphasis on histories of race, empire, and medicine. And her first book, Black Bodies, White Gold, Art, Cotton, and Commerce in the Atlantic World, is now available for pre-order from Duke University or for real order here through the fantastic Rabble Books. If you have not been to Maylands to check out Rabble Books and Games, it is a truly incredible independent bookstore and they are stocking Anna's book and are here um, with a bit of a story around how you can get them. Oh yes, so just because of COVID delivery times, we couldn't get them in time, but if you come, you can order them with us and we can get them to you. Hopefully, they'll be here in the next couple of weeks. So, Anna, welcome. Thanks. And congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I can keep saying that. <laughs> so, I wanted to start with a question about um, why this book uh, and why you, as the author of this book, so perhaps start backwards by answering the question of you. Why did you choose this book to write? Uh, okay, well, just before I start, there is a book um, that you can have a look at that you can pass around if you want to. Um, there are some lovely pictures in there. That's an interesting So why, why me? Well, I think um, the book is really about seeing and the, the implications of how we see. And so I think I, I have been thinking about that for a very, very long time as someone who's grown up in all these different places, but also as someone who was a nurse. Um, and I, can you hear me? No. Nope. <coughs> okay. Project. Yes, you have to project. <laughs> so I, as I said, I was a nurse and I think um, the implications of how we see people and how that affects how we treat people is so stark in in the health system. And I was taught by Māori and Pacifica women in New Zealand who really made me understand this relationship between between seeing and um, and 
then the sort of structural implications of, of, um, of that process. And so when I went back to university, um, I thought, oh, I'll do history or something. And then this woman who's sitting over there in the back in Clarissa Ball, I sat in one of her classes and she deconstructed this painting for me, um, or for, for us. She was teaching, I think it was like one, art history 101, something like that. Sorry, say that again. What was the, what was the, what's the first year lecture that you teach, that survey? History, uh, modern art, 20th modern, century. Yes, that's it. Yes. Would you like me to tell you the very moment that, <laughs> Please. that clicked? Yes. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I don't want to hijack this, but I have to tell you this. It's the most extraordinary thing. So, I was, it was semester two, and I was teaching in Alexander Lecture Theatre which is a huge lecture theatre, it seats about 300. And Anna, as always, was sitting in the second back row. There are about 180 students sitting in front of her. And the lecture was on, I was doing a, a, a four week series of lectures on the way in which sight itself, and the way in which the act of looking, and the way in which seeing is, is racialised. I was trying to unpick the way in which the very act of looking is always done within a racialised framework. So I was blabbering on, as I do in lectures, and some lovely pictures to look at, lovely paintings and photographs. And uh, I happened to... Uh, so this particular lecture was on whiteness and the way in which seeing is coded through ideas of whiteness. And I was looking down at the lectern to press the slide thing so it would go on to the next image. And as I was doing it, I was looking down to press the bloody thing, whatever it's called. <laughs> button. The button. The button. <laughs> Thank you, Terry Ann. And I happened to say as I was doing this, uh, I happen to say that white, that the vision is fundamentally white. Looking is fundamentally white. Irrespective of one's race, looking is fundamentally white. And I happen to look up, and as the moment I looked up, there is Anna, who's always like this on the laptop, as you know, and I knew she'd been taking notes throughout the lecture, and at the very moment I said that, I happened to look up, I caught Anna and she bolted up out of her seat and was just aghast at what I had said. And I knew that I had her. I knew that there in the back row of this lecture theatre was an emerging splendid art historian. And I was right because here we are at the launch of her book about race, seeing and looking. And now I'll sit down and hand over. <laughs>
brilliant. So, as a not, so some people in this room will be art historians and academics, and some of us will not be. And I am definitely in the not camp. And and so I th I think about this book in a, a really simple way. So it's a, a a book that is trying to that is doing many things um, and doing many things in a really complex and layered and beautiful way, um, but also many things that are like basic and important to think about how you live your life today. Uh, so as I was reading this book, I was thinking about my son who's 10, who I, uh, don't judge me, but I do let him play Fortnite, the children's game. And there is so much in this book that helps us to understand what it means to be, um, what it means to understand the history of uh, particularly US blackness. Uh, so I want to. So what I want to say is, this is a part. This book is um, theoretical and really interesting on many levels, but it's also a manual. It's got like all these pictures, which are like, look at the beautiful pictures, and this is how you think about art. Um, and then it's also, I think, very importantly, a book that is about how you think about race, uh, not just about racism, uh, but how you think about whiteness and how you think about what's happening in the moment where you see something and try to understand what it means. So it's a really important book and I urge you to read it and to keep reading it even in the bits that are hard. <laughs> and I say that actually deliberately because I think so many non-academic people are shy and worried about what it means to grapple with complicated ideas. So the conversation I would love us to have today is about really complicated ideas. And I'm gonna push Anna to make it like easy enough for my Fortnite child to understand, okay? Or for me to understand, who is not decidedly an academic. Um, but you will understand it if you read it and you grapple with it. So it's a beautiful, beautiful book. But I want us to have a conversation that is like, so what does this mean? So the first question I'm gonna ask you, Anna, is, is why cotton is important? Why you why you choose cotton to think about slavery? Because it's like there's this like kind of automatic association you hear about you know uh, there's like all these slurs and cotton picking, etc. Right? So so those are like associations you may have heard. But I want you to talk us through why cotton mattered within the context of slavery in the United States. Well. On a very basic level, cotton and enslaved people were both commodities. And as Frederick Douglass would often say, still to yourself, sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, we should have had mine. So what I was saying was cotton, you know, in the 19th century, cotton and enslaved people were both commodities. You know, they were exchanged for each other. And as Frederick Douglass used to always remind his audiences in the US and the UK, when the price of cotton goes up, so does the price of an enslaved person. So that that economic logic kind of in the 19th century bind or bound enslaved people and I think bound blackness to to cotton. So for me, you know, it was the book is really trying to untangle that um, and trying to as you say um, <clears throat> work out what does that economic logic mean for ways of seeing um, blackness um, and black people? So, so then that takes us to the question of speculation, right? So, cotton is a commodity. At this time, black people, black people's bodies in particular, are a commodity. And if you speculate on the price of one, it has an effect on the price of the other. There is this um, really interesting um, part in the book where you talk about, so which leads us to, and then I'm not going to pronounce it properly, futurity. 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 Yeah. So we've got speculation on bodies and cotton, and then we've got this notion of futurity, which is fundamental to understanding the ideas in this book. So can you talk us through futurity? Sure. So this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing a 101. I know I'm like probably going too slow for lots of people, but I need it. <laughs> no, no, these, these are, I mean, these are
a hard concept to me, so I'm glad that you got something out of this book. I got a lot out of this book. <laughs> Futurity is a term that um, this amazing historian called Jennifer Morgan has con conceptualized, and she's based in New York, and she's, she writes about um, laboring enslaved women. And so for her, Futurity is this term that's linked to this idea of future profit, so enslaved people were bought and sold on this idea of the future profit they would they would bring. And for her, it's um, it's the enslaved uh, black female body that really symbolizes this because there's two kinds of return, right? It's the kind of re return of non-reproductive and reproductive labor. And so, her, so that's really where I I drew that concept, but for me it's also about thinking through how how this, I, this idea of futurity frames the way we see people as having to prove themselves, their worth. prove their worth, you know, and so this, 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 is, the, this is how I'm, I'm drawing on that concept. So part of the, um, you know, global conversation we've been having in the last year is this notion that black lives matter, right? So we've We've been chanting it, and we've been insisting that Black Lives Matter. And in many ways, this um, book is a sort of art historical companion to that movie, to that movement, right? This idea that Black lives matter to the extent that they could be costed, and we are now living in a period of the afterlife of slavery. So slavery is done. What is the utility of Black people anymore? once you stop commodifying them? Like what do they, what value do black people have? I think is the question that you force us to ask in this book. So how have various artists thought about that question? Is I think the question you're asking us to think about, right? So I wanna walk us through a couple of artists who you, who you write about, who are thinking about these questions. Um, so I was, I was very taken by um, many of them. So I'm just gonna like call out a name and then I, you're gonna say, Degas, oh my God, he, and then you're gonna talk about him, okay. Oh, so that's, yeah, 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 totally. Because I think, but that's, that's why I want you to, that's why I want you to unpack it for us. <laughs> so that the next time we're having a conversation at dinner, we could be like, oh Degas. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's okay. it. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, um, so you have this. So on page forty, which is not the same on my iPad as it is in the book, and I didn't have the book, which we now all have. I can find page So, you talk about the way that his paintings naturalize blackness, uh, placing blackness as part of a landscape of plantation. are made to look as if they're part of the landscape, right? That blackness is like nature. Yeah. It's like a kind of foundational idea. And I want you to talk about that because I think it's cool and interesting. Well, I should say, you know, like, I, Winslow Homer is, you know, one of the canonical artists in the 19th century American art, even like 19th century art canon. And so, I mean, my book, it is an art history, but I've don't really talk about these important um, artists much, apart from these two, and it's mostly to kind of deconstruct, them. yeah, just, just them. Yeah, 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 deconstruct them, and but also to do that because I think it's important to emphasize how these ideas are embedded in you know genealogies of um, of art history and of history, and you know how they still shape the kinds of knowledge that's produced today. Um, so that painting was made by Winslow Homer, I think it's 1876. It shows two, um, two sharecroppers in a, in a plantation full of cotton. And what you notice, I think, immediately is that they're really 
squeeze into the front, into the foreground of the painting, and the cotton sort of undulates behind them like a like a sea. So there's a sense of them like being unable to move almost. You know, they're they're surrounded by cotton. There's cotton sort of spilling out of their bags and their clothes. Um, and what's really fascinating is that when you look really closely, these cotton balls. Um, they're the, they're the bits of the painting where you see the artist's hand. So it's as if you know, the cotton is sort of signifying his labor. At the same time, the cotton is you know, stopping, obstructing these women from moving, and their labor seems almost you know, Invis invisible, invisible. And, and also kind of impossible, like never ending. I think the, you know, this is the time of, of the matter. So it's post emancipation, it's in the reconstruction era, um, just towards the end of it. These women are free, that they you know, they're not enslaved, but there's very little really to, to tell that they are actually free. So it's this sort of sense of, you know, they're they're free but not not yet actually. You know, so it's, it's a kind of um, and I think in that way too, that association between the, the black female body and the land is really emphasized there. Um, and I think that's kind of also goes to your point about this naturalization um, of, of black women, but I think also of, um, of labor as being a kind of indicator of, of social value. Um, that, that's how I read that painting. Um, so I was struck by Degas and the story about him deciding to paint as a kind of, yeah. almost like a PR, like I need some money yeah. and you know, there's some rich, you know, people who have plantation, cotton plantations. Um, how do I think about making a painting for them that they're gonna hang on their walls that's gonna make them look rich? I mean, I, I found that um, art as public relations and the deep connectedness between art and commerce in like a very kind of unabashed, unashamed way. Um, which the idea of high art kind of obscures. Yes. Um, yeah. So just talk about that because I found that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Homer is the same. Degas and Edgar Degas, who was you know the leader of the Impressionists, blah blah blah. Um, you know, another kind of canonical artist who has it, actually now there's a lot of work being done on kind of his Creole um, Creole history. His his uncle in New Orleans was. Connected to what would become the kind of Ku Klux Klan militia. So I mean, there's there's these deep histories of racism embedded in many of our formative art historical narratives. But um, but both Homer and Degas made these cotton paintings very specifically for um, cotton uh, warehouse industry industrialists in Manchester. Actually, so there was a there was a particular dealer that they were trying to get get connected with who would then sell their paintings on. And Homer was successful, but Degas wasn't. Um, so yeah, so Degas' painting shows his uncle's cot. So Degas comes to New Orleans um, in the early 1870s from Paris. He's broke and he suddenly has to start painting for money. Um, and so he decides he's going to paint some cotton pictures um, to make money. And he he he, he paints this portrait of um, of the of the the cotton traders in his uncle's warehouse. Um, so it's all kind of white men uh, looking at this black cotton. It's all about speculation. And you know, again, it's like you're watching these men assess the cotton, and you're and you're also actually watching and assessing the artist by labor, just in a similar way that. Um, and yeah, so he, he painted this painting about speculation, essentially, um, in, and, and, the, and you sort of see you know, his, his uncle and his brothers looking at the stock market, assessing the cotton, um, you're seeing accountants like turning the cotton, you know, the values as my, my accountant brother in the background, um, you know, like actually kind of turning that that value of cotton into the, the its exchange value on the stock market. Um, so it's quite an amazing painting, but it isn't often, and we don't often talk about these, these commercial um, 
question. Now we know often talk about artists actually, artists and labor and how they're thinking about making some money. Making money. So yeah. that was that was quite fun actually to yeah. write those things that you know. Yeah, because um, it pierces the bubble about art as just like some lofty, la di da fun thing. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, so then, so you do this thing where you like, so, so you start in some ways, not entirely, but you do the canonical, like the big, the big old boys, the old white guys, and like there, you sort of uh, help us to understand the meta narrative that's happening. But then you come to the, uh, the ways in which black artists and black thinkers have engaged with this and have projected what it means to be black, right? And so, so, so you're conversation about Du Bois who was fascinating to me because first of all the guy was like he lived so long he's like everywhere in the you know 19th and 20th century you can't escape him you talk about anything black Du Bois is there you're like in America he's there you go to Europe he's there you go to Africa you're like whoa he was in Ghana I'm like what's going on this guy is everywhere right <laughs> sociology art he's like all over the show so I'm always fascinated by anything with Du Bois and so there's the Paris Expo where he yes. kind of like presents this thing. So talk to us about Du Bois. So I'm just throwing out the name and then she's going to... There's, there's, there's a photo in that in there somewhere too of oh, that. But, so Du Bois, sociologist, intellectual, writer, photographer, um, art theorist as well. Uh, he, in the 19... U.S. portion of the Paris um, World Exposition, and it's a it's an exhibition that is really focused on kind of highlighting um, black and lived black, black progress. Yeah, black progress. And, so, and this is very I'm just simplifying here, but yes, so highlighting kind of black progress. I mean, it's specifically focused on the black middle class, but the, you know, but the idea really is to kind of emphasize how black people have been always contributing to American, to the US society. So there are, you know, there are photographs of from you know, different um, black universities and colleges. There are photographs of you know, black business people. Um, there's photographs of black middle class homes and neighborhoods. Um, so it's like a we, we, we too are civilized kind of yeah, narrative. Exactly. Yeah. But it was really, I mean, it was really about meeting that racialized gaze head on yeah. and disrupting it. And so I think, you know, it's looking at it and it also used data in really, really fascinating ways. Like he has loads of what we would call infographics up there and lots of charts and, you know, because he understood that this kind of information had to be translated into a particular way to be, you know, to be valued. So, so just to connect it, so what you've got is like these white guys who are kind of, uh, in some ways, in, invisibilizing what it take, what it means to um, to be a black subject. Like, so they're saying, you, you know, look at these black people; they're part of the landscape. Look at uh, black people and cotton; they go together. You, you've got this like thing that's happening, which is not, in some ways, showing its face. And then you've got two boys who's saying. Regardless of how I think we might critique him in today's language, the kids would be extremely critical of him, his respectability politics, right? Um, but regardless of that critique, what he's saying is, I'm going to talk about race explicitly. I'm going to talk about black people, and this is what we look like. This is who we are. And of course, the Paris Expo, all that stuff was like when they would like bring the you know the world's people to showcase, you know. So this is like the American Negro. That's what they do, right? So. So you've got Du Bois like doing this explicit thing of like speaking back to that and saying, you're not gonna invisibilize, you're gonna actually, this is real, this is us, right? Yeah. So then I wanna jump forward to like a contemporary, so, so then we get to Romar Bearden, <sighs> whom I love, yeah. right? So tell us about Romar Bearden. So the, the, I, the way I, like that kind of connection that I try to make in that chapter is, it's all about this idea of again, of, you know, of value. Like how do, how how are black people seen? Um, du Bois is showing how black people are um, themselves. are themselves and how they 
how they have contributed. Um, so he's sort of trying to undercut that kind of future get, you know, futurity narrative. And then I, I end with some artists in the 20th century who I think do something else in terms of um, in terms of drawing on that history of uh, of plantations and, and labor. Um, and Romare Bearden, he, he made he well, I mean, he, he worked with in many media, but um, I guess he's probably most known for his collages. And he uses in, in the work that I I um, include in the book, he's using. I think, you know, bits of images cut out from newspapers and magazines, um, and he sort of recreated a kind of a cotton plantation, but the, the plantation is not a site of, of the illusion or the kind of erasure of subject of black subjectivity and black value, but it becomes a site of community and community building. And so labor in his, uh, in his collage is not, is not just about the use value, but it's about actually sustenance and labor as a kind of form of um, community um, and conviv conviviality, I suppose, um, in, in many ways. And so, yeah, so I, I think I think of artists like him as really trying to reformat that relationship between vision and value that you know, someone like Du Bois is, is engaging with in, in a very different way. So you, the, the, there's a great quote where you talk about Bearden is insisting that cotton picking is the foundation of a life forged in community. Yes. And so part of what this thing that uh, wherever you wherever you find uh, black people in the diaspora, you find this uh, connection between uh, suffering and meaning. So so in slavery, it's like you make meaning out of this horrendous thing that has happened to you, which looks like black creativity. And in, you know, with Bearden, you like, you look at him and he's like cutting up stuff and he's rearranging it and he's making this new thing out of stuff that was like different things. And you're like, oh, what? And, and he's displaying a, you know, a, a cotton picking scene, which we know what Degas does with it. Right? We know what like these other guys, like the old white guys have done with it. And then he's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to make this something that you actually haven't seen before, which is jazz, which is right, which is like the story of black people, you know, in the new world, as it were, all yeah, the time, absolutely. right? Yeah. Um, so again, it's like this fascinating thing. It's like it's always the same thing that whatever form or medium you choose, black people are always doing the same thing, which is saying there's this thing you're trying to do to us, and we're not going to accept that that's the thing that we are. Yeah, it's actually quite beautiful. So I saw Beard and I was like, oh my god, I knew I always loved him. <laughs> I just didn't understand what he was doing until I read your book. <laughs> yes, well, I'm glad that I clarified that with you. But he's also drawing on, I should say, textile, you know, like textile practices embedded in slavery too, quilting, um, particularly with his collages. And, um, and I think that Jack there, yeah, the metaphor of jazz is so important for him, but it is that kind of improvisation, reformatting, refiguring what the Um, Hank Williams. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, Hank Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What the cover? The cover. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Amazing. What a guy. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about him. <laughs> <laughs>
And so Hank is one of these artists who is just, I mean, he's just phenomenal. He is. Um, and I, I mean, it's hard to kind of defy his practice, but I think one, one way we could think about his practice is that he's really always working with archival images um, to try and kind of map their continued circulation and the implications of these historical ways of seeing um, on, in, in the contemporary, um, in, in our contemporary experience. And he, and he works kind of transnationally as well. So um, this work, this I mean, this is a, such a funny kind of picture, the, the history of it, the picture's not funny. Um, but so Hank found this on an album, on a record cover for a band called the Butterscotch Caboose. <laughs> Funny they never made it. Yeah. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the name. <laughs> they're from Memphis, I th and I think they were in the 1970s. I can't remember the time. And they had this song called Black Hands, White Cotton. And you can actually see it on YouTube. Um, and the lead singer is sort of trying to ventriloquize um, the experience of um, an African American man picking cotton. And so you know, they're drawing on like funk and like, different kinds of you know, different genres. Um, and so I guess Hank was looking at through different magazine archives and he found this, found this image. Um, and he, it's a cover under print, so it's a, it's a kind of printmaking in which you basically put this sort of really gritty um, material on top of the print and kind of, um, it, once you put the stone on and you print over it, it makes the surface really, uh, really shiny and kind of um, very textured and so he's, he's used that, that form, so when you look at it, you're, you're really, you're really forced to look at the actual organization of the image, right? So you, you notice like the hands that look like shackles, you notice the relationship between like the very leathery skin and this like fluffy white cotton. You can see the scars of the, the cotton thorns. Um, and so all of this, it's a real, there's such a um, focus on labor and it's such a, but it's also so aestheticized. And I think Hank really likes to play with those tensions of, you know, what the, um, what, what it, you know, how, how, again, like how do we, how are we looking at things and, and how we kind of look and hold these different visualities in, in contrast. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, when I saw that, that, that print, I was just like, oh, that's, I mean, and it also really, it also, I think, um, it's such a profound symbol of, of what I said earlier, that, that, so that, that clear association between cotton and blackness, particularly in the American you know, imagination. So that was, yeah, that was how I came across him. And then there's, um, there's cotton bowl. The cotton bowl. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I, th I think that's worth talking about too. And I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try and find I, it. I while some of you may have um, noticed, so this is in the end of chapter three. Um, so there's, there's a, um, and I can't remember all the NFL context of this, so Ethan, you might have to help me. But I think, isn't there like a stadium called the Cotton Bowl? No, isn't it? It's in Dallas? Yeah. yeah. It used to be, I think it's torn down. Isn't it a competition? Well, they used to have a... Oh, that's college football. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the Cotton Bowl. So he's, so he's drawing from that. <laughs> Sorry, Ethan. I just, you're like the resident. You're <laughs> right, the American. You're right, eye line. You're that. Right? Yeah. So he's taking, he's drawing on this, um, this cotton ball competition that's in college football. Um, and he's, he, you, you see a NFL player, a black NFL player, facing off, and I can't remember what that's called either. I've watched all of Friday Night Lights. <laughs> but I still don't remember Like, that. whatever a scrum is. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that thing. That's the line. Wow. <laughs> the line. And he's, he's facing a, a, um, a sharecropper. And so that, you know, in that... Head to head. Yeah. And, it's, and, so, and the sharecropper's in a kind of a cotton field. The NFL player is in a, you know, on a, um, just a playing field. And it's really about how 
you know, he's, it's about commodified labor as it continues in contemporary US society. It's about how, you know, how black, particularly black, um, black, black male athletes are kind of, you know, traded, how, how their labor is commodified. And, and again, that question of value, like how, how is blackness valued in, in contemporary US society? But it's also this gorgeous, glossy, it's really large, actually. Um, and it's really glossy, and so it looks like a magazine cover, and so he's also kind of riffing on that, again, that allure of advertising and, and you know, I'm kind of need to consume um, in different ways. Um, yeah, that, I mean, all of his work is just, yeah. it's really... Sort of, you go, <gasps> it hits you in the gut. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about that was, again, how it helps us to think about the now. Um, so, a few years ago, people will remember that Serena Williams was in town, uh, well, not in this town, but she was in Australia, and there was that furor about that cartoon that was done of her. Were you here? You weren't here. But no, there was I, that furor, so whatever, that guy who loves just to um, make the most sort of degrading kind of depictions of black people, and so they do this black, essentially like a, what, what was it called? The, 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 the way in which um, black people were depicted yeah, sort of really cool, like a yeah. real caricature, right? So they do this to Serena because she got upset at the, you know, at the, at the empire, etc., etc. And there proceeds this conversation in Australia that is entirely ahistorical, like entirely ahistorical, that uh, denies that any of this history exists, denies that there's um, a white, that even that there's a white gaze. That is essentially the premise of the public debate is that that does not exist. And so again, part of what I loved about reading this book was that it gives us some tools, some ways of thinking about what happens today. Like how do we navigate these really complicated things that happen here, even in Australia, right? Where, you know, this is not about Australia, but of course it absolutely is about settler form of societies and how they see people. Um, so yeah, I did appreciate that. I'm like getting converted. <laughs> okay, we're kind of like, I've asked a lot of questions and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that people have things to say or questions to ask um, or ways to input, and we've got a bit of time to do that. So, yeah. should we open it out? Do you want to do the reading first? Sure. Yeah, okay. Can we, can we get the, one of the books if back? If we can get please. the book back, <laughs> and then I'm going to ask Anna to read from the end of it, because I, I love what she writes there. And then that can be the basis for Anna, I think you might have to stand up. All right, yeah. 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 And get closer. Get closer. Am I Adam there? Uh, yeah, you're probably. Instagram live. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, you can fix it while I find it. So, um, this is a. Step in. Yeah. Okay. This is really a story about um, an employee of Yale University, you know, and where I did my PhD. And this, he, he, um, he did this kind of act. They are, but they were also symbols of this 
the Lost Cause ideology, which portrays the Confederacy and its course, a cause as essentially noble and promoted an image of benevolent enslavement. Now, in the center of the suite of windows was a plantation scene. Two African American figures stand amidst rows of cotton. They balance large cotton baskets on their head, and the cotton is barely knee high. The figures are neatly dressed, and they look as if they're in a garden. Behind them, in the distance, tall trees shade a plantation manor. They are shown to be in their place, and like cotton, they're objects to be sourced. Now, I, I, I never looked up and saw those windows, and so I never once thought about what it would be like to work under them. But a man called Corey Menneke did. He was a dining hall worker in Calhoun College, and his job located him in that hall for long hours. And as he recounted, he said to himself, you know, it's coming down today. So one summer day in 2016, Menefi climbed on top of a chair, holding a broomstick in his hand. He took that broomstick and shattered the faux medieval stained glass across the tables below. When I read about his act of civil protest, I was surprised at my own ignorance, but impressed by his courage. Menefi was initially charged with reckless endangerment and criminal mischief. He resigned from his job but was later reinstated. But what really remained with me was his explanation of his actions. He said, no employee should be subject to coming to work and seeing slave portraits on a daily basis. As Menefi's statement suggests, the ubiquitous nature of this kind of imagery, and this is the this is the window after it was broken. The, the ubiquitous nature of this kind of imagery is what makes it seem almost invisible and what also makes it so insidious. His actions powerfully reveal both the banality of such imagery and its material effects on the bodies and minds of those it purports to re represent. But many of these actions force us to also ask how can any of us look at this? This object, along with the history it directly represents, is not just about an African-American experience. It tells an institutional and national, even transnational story that implicates us all. Just a quick question. What's the role of the cotton gin? I'm forgetting. The cotton gin. Oh, in the it cleaned cotton. No, but I mean, did oh. it change the accelerate? Yes, it the impact on the, the yes. value of black bodies. It accelerated everything. It yes. accelerated everything. Yeah. So it was the start. It was the key transformation. Yeah, it was really, it was yeah, really key. Yes. To doing or undoing. It's like, like what? Oh, to, sorry. It, yeah, accelerated. I knew there was a role, but I couldn't remember if it was at the end or at the start. Oh, yeah. And yeah. its role in valuation yeah. is really sort of body. It's this relationship to technology. One of the descriptions of Australia is that Perth, actually, is that agriculture in Perth was always industrialized. It never had a labor, so you don't have large swaths, this was explained to me by someone, of migrants coming to Perth to deal with manual labor. By the time they were doing agriculture, it was either sheep or a lot of the technology was in place, so they weren't as dependent on large immigrant labor. So they, you don't have that here. Yeah. That's what that was yeah. told to me. And it has a different impact on uh, the context and the population and its history. Their history, like the last one that we did. Congratulations. It's really interesting that I hear speculation. So I think, you know, here, here, it's always been about kind of land speculation mm. from the very beginning, even before the beginning of the colony. And the 
quite that was tight, but I wonder, does land have, uh, is land part of that kind of movement in the kind of black bodies and and cotton as well? Is it's land part of that, or is that does it separately somehow? No, I think it really is because um, there's this when you know there's it's somewhere in my introduction, I think, but they called it like the cotton fever or like the cotton rush. So and it was very much tied to land. So these um, plantation owners, you know, were clearing. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, he can hear me. <laughs> um, so just <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> Okay. So yeah, so planters, you know, plantation owners were um, were like were mad trying to get land and um, you know develop it for for cotton. So it's always, I think, it is really definitely associated with the speculation about you know about land and ownership and possession. Um, and a lot of the kind of landscape imagery, I think, re reinforces that kind of association between agricultural labor and um, you know, and possessing land, um, you know, yeah, so, but, and what I was saying was that, so it's, there was, in the 19th century, they called it like a, I've got to, I can't remember, it was like a, it was like the equivalent of a gold rush, yeah, but it was like, a cotton rush, cotton that's what rush. You said. yeah, it is cotton, right? Okay. Forget it, you know, that's what you wrote. Yeah. Than me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they called it the cotton rush, and, um, there's, there's lots of 19th century like, agricultural manuals that describe all of this kind of, you know, desire for more, more land. Hey. Uh, hi. 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 I just wanted to ask you, how did your personal experience uh, as a, as a um, shrine contaminant uh, through the Shrine Civil War and under that colonial experience inform your perspectives on, uh, on this, your life? Did you question. ask him to ask that question? No, I didn't. I think that's really, it really permeates everything because I think that was when I first came to understand even, you know, as a four-year-old or five-year-old or whatever, however old I was when the war started, um, that relationship between seeing and its implications, right, that kind of racialized way of seeing. Um, and so I think that it took me a long time to figure out that was maybe what I was trying to understand. But I think that definitely has shaped has shaped this. But um, I mean, now it, what it what it has also made me think about is plantations in other places. So my next book is about plantations in Sri Lanka and the Caribbean, and you know, so kind of going back to that going back to that past history in different ways. and erasure of black bodies from landscapes and I'm thinking in particular of Australia and um, colonial landscapes which are quite often completely devoid of black bodies you know there's there's none you know you look at Tasmania and the landscape painting mm -hmm. there's no land there's no black people but it's partly they were exter have been exterminated by that point. I want to ask a bit about guilt and the portrayal of black bodies or erasure of black bodies from landscapes and how they're commoditized because you know we owned it we came with this concept in Australia of Terra Nullius and you know that these landscapes were there we market. We actually used black people, slavery was being abolished by this time it was very kind of you know not work to kind of talk about slavery in the you know early eighteen hundreds but we did enslave in Australia we, you know we used the Eucharist like black people. You know, we use an enormous amount of black over here in the sugar plantations in Queensland and like black Aboriginal bodies built. It wasn't just technology, there was a lot of black labour in this land and it's not portrayed in landscapes here. You know, we have these really idyllic pastoral landscapes and not a black person. You know, what about when black bodies just not represented for the um, landscapes that actually help form in the capital? 
so I don't know. Sorry. What the, I don't, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> like, I'm sort of talking about just where black people are not yeah. known, but yeah. are, are so intrinsically tied yeah. to the and value I, of this land in yeah. colonial painting. Said that because it was those pictures, that stained glass gallery in the ball, and you use the word kitsch about that, and that sort of relationship between folksiness, landscape, and kitsch, whether it, and, you know, even thinking sort of German at the same time. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear We can hear you. Sorry, um, I, sorry. <laughs> I was saying um, that when you mentioned about landscape, but yeah. also I was thinking about the, the, the stained glass of Calhoun Ball, and how you described it as kitsch, and that relationship of kitsch, of the idea of a kitsch, to a kind of folksy landscape idyll that is mm. used to also, as, it, that the, as you were saying, the form erases even more so, because it's, it's a method of controlling. And I, then I was thinking about how that connects to that horrendous cartoon that Serena Williams one, but which has also got that element of kitsch in it, and yes. his, his drawing, whatever you might call it, his style is highly, highly kitschified. Mm. And it also, it almost seems like a form of culturally accepted camouflage that allows yeah, these things yeah. to be. And I think that's a, that's a good description of landscape painting in the 19th century, like as a kind of camouflage, you know? Because yeah. it's playing at innocence. Yeah. Yeah. So all yeah. of them are pretending to be childlike, what you, what you want to, yeah. It's natural. Act. It's natural, it's yeah. childlike. This is how it is. Sort of fade into the background and disappear. 
and it made me think about how indigenous people were classified as flora and fauna. Mm. And then I wondered, do you think that's also the same thing as, um, I was born in Kenya, and a lot of imagery about Africa is always this people either, I don't know, walking past elephants or something, and or dying mm. of hunger. Yeah. Do you think that's related or completely different? where the imagery that's always pushed out yeah. is sort of war, fame, and war, yeah. sort of this natural um, habitat that does not reflect modern Africa. No. You mean no. We'll repeat the question? So the question is about, um, so the question asker is from Kenya, and she's saying this conversation about how images of, of black people uh, in Australia, it's erasure, in America, we've talked about this naturalization question. She says in, in the African context, it's often war, famine, uh, neck close to animals, dying out, like is it, yeah. is this all a similar phenomenon? That's the question. I think so. I think it's, a, it, it's certainly connected to colonial, yeah. sorry, can you hear me? You're looking at, can you hear? No. Not really. <laughs> it's all connected to these colonial frameworks of racial science, you know, that, that constructed um, hierarchy of races that then also that did frame you know how how imagery was made about these places and, and these um, and these and these bodies and I think because that, that it's you know I think these kinds of images like the war the famine that also reconstructs um, the African content continent in a particular way in kind of the colonial relationship and then that association between um, natural world and racialized bodies is I think very much very much embedded in a lot of colonial imagery um, from I mean into the 20th century for sure um, yeah so I, th I think there is that transnational kind of colonial net Thank you everyone for, for coming, for asking, for probing, for reading, for buying. I think there are so many ways in which this book helps us to think about um, the world, not just as we see it, but the world as it has been made. Um, and one of the um, important things about this book is um, the way in which it doesn't simply accept the colonial gaze, but it um, takes very seriously the work of black artists we're constantly in the business of remaking the world in the image in which we want it uh, to look. So, thank you.